This right here is the KSO Show, your home for K-State coverage. Stay current on what's happening in the wildcat world of sports. By the end, you might want to tell your friends about us. Or not. But hey, you should. Let's get it. It is Matt Hall of K-State Online with another road report. I guess we'll call it for you. I am just now leaving Morgantown, heading back towards Manhattan after watching K-State beat West Virginia last night at the WVU Coliseum in Morgantown. The Wildcats won by 14 after struggling for a pretty good portion of time. The first half for K-State did not go particularly well. Uh, typically, the keys I write, you know, for a K-State game aren't aren't terribly accurate, uh, and last night proved to be the case as well. The first two things that I wrote K-State needed to do to win this game in Morgantown was to not miss easy shots inside and to play defense without fouling, and those are two things the Wildcats certainly did not accomplish against the Mountaineers. I'm not even sure off the top of my head how many dunk or open layup attempts K-State missed in that game. It could have been as many. Of, I can think of four off the top of my head. It may have been more. So that certainly wasn't something that was fixed after the Iowa State game. And then the uh, the fouling part, of course, you all saw very well. Everybody, at least if you're uh, big for K-State, got into foul trouble in that game. The Wildcats let West Virginia into the double bonus. Both halves could not stop fouling and allowed West Virginia to stay in that game for a good period of time. But fortunately for K-State, the third thing I wrote was that they needed a big game from Barry Brown, and they certainly got that. Brown, to me, at this point, looks like the Big 12 player of the year if the season were to end today. Another 20-point effort last night, and that went on the road. He also had four steals, I believe four assists, three rebounds. Just a fantastic player. Uh, to sit around the West Virginia media in that game, which was kind of a unique opportunity, and hear them talk about Barry Brown and how good they believe him to be. Uh, at least from, from that media and that fan base, they certainly would accept him uh, very well as their Big 12 Conference Player of the Year. I think Bob Huggins would as well. He he talked about Barry quite a bit in the postgame press conference, comparing him to former West Virginia great Javon Carter and the improvement he made in his time with the Mountaineers. And he's now seen, Javon Carter is, as one of the better players in a storied history of West Virginia basketball. So it'll be interesting to see as, as Barry Brown's season progresses and his career wraps up, how much he can move his name up that list you know, at Kansas State. It wasn't just Barry Brown last night. A lot of credit should go to Xavier Sneed. Sneed was a guy who missed a couple of those easy ones, uh, two almost back-to-back -back in the first half where he missed a layup on a breakaway and had a ball slip out of his hands on a, on a dunk attempt on another breakaway. But he sure made up for it in the second half. Barry Brown was the guy who I thought K -State, kept K-State either within striking distance or slightly ahead while everybody else was struggling. Xavier Sneed was the one who really put it away. I believe he went 4-4 four four from three in the second half alone. I think he had five or six boards in the second half. And he really ensured that West Virginia, who was hanging around until about that 12-11 minute mark, wouldn't do so anymore. So Brown, player of the game for me, but Xavier Sneed was right there with him and one of the most important players some really positive news to come out of the game other than getting you know your 20th win and your 10th win in big 12 play and and maintaining at least you know a one game lead in the league would be would be the health of k-state uh, guys like dean wade and cam stokes you know on the on the pessimistic side they may deal with these nagging injuries throughout the year and that's certainly going to be a an issue for k-state but again on the positive side both played last night cam stokes wasn't as what's the word perhaps publicized as far as his injury situation is Dean Wade but it also wasn't thought to be as serious either way uh, there was a time going into that contest against West Virginia where Bruce Weber thought he could be without both Stokes and Wade both played and both played a lot for Dean Wade he wasn't perfect he had a couple of uh, easy messes on on fadeaways but he was good early for K-State and he gave over 30 minutes I was shocked you know on the on the way out here to Morgantown I never expected that to happen I, I didn't know that he would play, let alone play that much. Cam Stokes struggled with his shot a little bit last night. You could also see at one point, I believe it was midway through the second half, I thought he did tweak his foot again. You could see his face react a little bit in pain, but he didn't leave the floor. He played throughout. I spoke a little bit with Cam and Barry after the game, and after the presser, uh, just in general, and they both, they both seemed fine. Cam didn't have any concerns about his injury. It didn't seem like... Uh, both guys were really, really happy, of course, to get back on the winning track. That loss to Iowa State certainly, certainly frustrated them. 
Uh, an interesting topic coming out of this game is a lot of the big guys that fans have been curious about and probably had some concerns about uh, beyond Levi Stockard or even including Levi Stockard and James Love and Nigel Shad and Austin Trice. They all saw the floor due to that foul trouble I talked about earlier against West Virginia and really struggled uh, against Culver, the Mountaineers freshman big man who was very impressive to see in person and drew a ton of fouls on K-State. But, you know, the Wildcats got to see what they had, or at least fans did, in each of those players. I thought out of all of them, Austin Trice may have played the best. Uh, and, and, you know, in hindsight, it's easy to say this, but it seems like he was probably the best physical matchup for a guy like Culver, who, you know, obviously a very not, not overly tall, but very strong, very wide, a very good base. And I think Austin Trice probably matched that the best, although they all struggled uh, against the Mountaineers, and that's how part of the reason Casey ended up with so much foul trouble. But, but either way, you know the Wildcats get the win. Like I said, they improved to I believe twenty and six on the season, ten and three in the Big Twelve. A full game up in the loss column on KU, who of course lost at West Virginia. So as you're thinking about how ugly that game was at times and any frustrations you have, you sure have the right to. But it's winning road games like this over and over again, which is what K State has done in league play. Uh, which is why the Wildcats are in first and Kansas is not, for example. Texas Tech also lurking a game behind. Iowa State a game and a half back, but just one game in the loss column. Huge game this weekend for Big 12 implications. We'll talk a lot about big picture Big 12 stuff when we meet Thursday at the Tallgrass Tap House, who sponsors the KSO, the KSO show and this little drive talk I'm having as well. I do appreciate them as well as Bourbon and Baker and Harry's, both also located on points in Manhattan. But again, it's going to be a big weekend for Big 12 basketball as it relates to the league race. Maybe K-State's two biggest challengers, at least two of the three in Kansas and Texas Tech, will play in Lubbock. So that's going to be fascinating to watch on a day where K-State should be okay. The Wildcats have a home game against Oklahoma State, a team they led by, I think, 34 in the second half in Stillwater a few weeks ago before winning by about 20. Oklahoma State did get a win against TCU, a team that's really fallen off here late under Jamie Dixon. The Horned Frogs looked at one point like a Big 12 contender and a surefire NCAA tournament team. Now they're slipping a little bit. It's interesting from a K-State perspective because other than at Kansas, at TCU was the one game left on the K-State schedule that probably really scared you. You have to take care of business one game at a time, and I didn't even mention the home games against Baylor and Oklahoma as well as Oklahoma State. But those three home games, K-State will be significant favorites in. The game at Kansas, the Wildcats will be the underdog. If this TCU game in Fort Worth ends up having a shot to, to claim a Big 12 title for K-State, it might come against a team that's really struggling. And you have to wonder how many K-State fans could get into that building if that game is for a league title. I imagine, imagine there could be quite a few. So just a couple of days after things looked pretty bleak for K-State, at least in the sense that they had lost their cushion in the conference. We feared, at least fans feared, that we had lost Dean Wade for a period of time. Neither of those things have really happened as the Wildcats bounce back to win in Morgantown last night. They'll get five days of rest. They headed back last night. They're already back in Manhattan. So they'll have four to five days of rest, depending on how you look at it. A couple of practices thrown in there late in the week before taking on Oklahoma State on Saturday in hopes of their 11th Big 12 win and starting a new winning streak or extending a winning streak to two games after starting perhaps another one against the same team they beat to start the nine-game Big 12 winning streak in West Virginia. I'm Matt Hall for Case It Online.